morning, good evening. Hello. <laughs> it is good evening. Lovely. Oh, it is lovely to see you and thank you so much for joining us. So colleagues, let's have a wonderful time. The dream team are here. It's so bohemian. I'm just going to explode and that's so appropriate to the topic this week. So as always, I'll commence with an acknowledgement of country, acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, elders past and present and any indigenous colleagues with us today. And look, we have a complicated book this week. I'm going to be fascinated to see what this brilliant group of people do with this book. I have a complicated relationship with this book. So this is Willful Subjects, we're here, published by Duke University Press in 2014. So as may become important later, the global financial crisis has happened and that has occurred during the writing of this book that we may return to. So, so much to say, I've, I've got about 57 different topics we could talk about, but I thought colleagues, we might start with a discussion of the relationship between willfulness, to be willful and authority and power. I'll tell you why I got there. I want to start with a quote that, that flummoxed me so you can explain it to me. And it's, again, it's from page one. Quote, willfulness is thus compromising. It compromises the capacity of the subject to survive, let alone flourish. The punishment for willfulness is a passive willing of death. An allowing of death. So we're back here again, skulls on the table, rock and roll. So we're at death at the start. Welcome to optimism. So I'm interested, and Thomas, it is linking with the conversation we had about COVID and masks and releasing the restrictions and so forth in many ways, um, about willfulness. And, you know, is willfulness punished, right? And if you think about willfulness through COVID, I wonder if it was punished. Have you got a vibe on willfulness and authority and power and the punishment of it. You got a vibe on this, Thomas? Yeah, I think this is where I was mostly confused in the text, actually. So I agree with Ahmed in the sense that if we're talking about the disciplined society, so like I picked up a lot of Foucault in the book, that it's very easy to pinpoint who is the willful subject because they're the person who's standing out in the line. But since we've kind of transitioned into more of like a control society where things get very easily uh, commodified, I wonder if willfulness is just something that can be like, I don't know, transmuted into something that, you know, just replicates the status quo in the first place. And so I think of something like maybe RuPaul's Drag Race, where like drag queens in the 60s and 70s were very willful subjects who stood out against the discipline society but presently are hyper commodified and just replicate the pre-existing society that we're in. So I kind of went back to a little bit of uh, Mark Fisher's capitalist realism after yes. I read this book, because I was like, okay, what is the distinction we're talking about here? And how can we actually be willful in the control society if it's just going to be commodified anyway? Now, Thomas, it's funny, you and I, again, are existentially linked. As I said, I can't remember a time before I met you, and I went there as well. So what I was interested in, and Aiden and I have also talked about it through the week as we've been reading the book again, is, is the absence of class. There's a couple of mention of, of bankers, I think on page 101 and 102, but how class is managed here and the commodification of willfulness, and you said it, it was on my notes. Have you got a further commentary about that, Thomas, about, about the, the economic value of being willful? Um, I think the first thought that I had is there's kind of a discrepancy between like feeling willful and then enacting that behavior politically in a way that doesn't like quite translate to Ahmed's argument of willfulness. So if I think of something like cancel culture, for example, like I can feel empowered, I can tweet things, I can get on bandwagons to cancel somebody. But one, do we actually ever cancel someone? And two, what profit does that person receive from having so much engagement online? Because all press is good press. And so you get into things like outrage marketing, where, you know, the company will put out this ad that like, you know, pisses off like a sect of people who all like put their razors in the toilet. 
But by posting those videos and thinking that you're being willful, you're only creating free advertising for that company for the opposite side to then go, oh, well, the people I don't like don't like this thing, so I must like it. And so it just kind of replicates itself. So I think that there are ways to be willful. I just can't quite pinpoint where. So that's kind of the question I brought tonight is kind of like, where is the willful subject in the control society? Right. So it's, 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 we're nine minutes into the seminar and Thomas has already exploded my entire universe. That's exactly my issue. And can I say, Thomas, it's about to be a sort of public holiday Monday uh, in Adelaide and I'm finishing off my Jordan Peterson monograph. Yeah, so this is this is my final. That sounds weekend. like a joy. Well, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but again, he, in terms of the commodification of willfulness, uh, dancing on the rights of trans communities in particular, embodies that. But look, Thomas, I'm going to go straight to Aiden if I can, because you two really, if you were at the same university doing the same PhD program, that would be beautiful, and it's amazing that you're both in the same call. So Aidan, you know, you, you've seen Thomas in the past, Aidan, Thomas, Thomas, Aidan. Um, Aidan, talk to me about commodification. And do you want to go to class early, mate? Talk to me about the, the power and how willfulness may or may not be punished. Yeah, well, so willfulness for me feels like a weird interpretation maybe of uh, agency, I guess, in a sense. So it's like an expression of agency, maybe in a... Um, in a really conscious, conscientious kind of way, like it's that expression of, you know, being able to choose. But um, if we think about, and I can't remember who it was that said it, but it was somebody in this group a few weeks ago who might not be here, but said, mm. think, you know, think they were thinking of capitalism as an epistemology. And so if, if the way that we think of knowledge and the way that we think of the way that society is organized, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, willfulness is only willfulness to choose in this sort of spectrum that we're conditioned in so you know thinking about agency in terms of we've only got choices within capitalism essentially you know so there's the i don't, I don't know willfulness to me that it was a really weird way of coming at this like you know what choice do we have what opportunity do we have and and what's actually given to us because what's ascribed upon us um, what do we get to choose? Do we get to choose anything much? Yeah, yes, and, and look, I, I'm going to involve Leanne in this because as you know, Aidan, because you've read this stuff, I, I did work on the cascading simulacrum. So the real representation simulacrum and it cascades and it increases in speed. So we think we're being willful. We think we are resisting and actually it's incorporated and reincorporated and reinscribed at such speed that yes. we maybe have this micro moment of, of willfulness that is a space outside of capitalism, but it, it is so temporally small that it perhaps blocks consciousness of that moment. Now, again, I'm depressed, I'm an old goth, but, but Leanne, do you want to come in here on, on this? I mean, you know, there's 57 things we can talk about. We sort of stuck here for the first bit of the, of the gig. And I think it's worth it, Leanne, thinking about commodification and willfulness. Where are you on this from Thomas's and Aidan's gig? Um, look, I think it's an interesting perspective on it. It's not mm. the perspective I came in on it. I saw it, I got a little cranky, as I do, you know. Hey, that's unusual. <laughs> that's unusual, I know. Um, I saw it very much as willfulness as transitional, as willfulness is not, a, is not an end point, it's not a... It's not an identity from which we come from that we actually move through willfulness as a transition into something else. It's a becoming. It's something that we, um, so I think she introduced quite late for me the idea of its relationship to childhood, to, to, to children, that the idea of a child being willful. Yes. And there's and this that idea. pedagogy comment too, Leanne. The yeah, willfulness in, in relation to pedagogy, yes. And to me, it's this moment, it, willfulness is a deviance. Willfulness yes. is, is, is a deviance and it's established always in a relationship to power and it's about bringing you back. It's a label that is imposed on you to bring you back into line because you're seen to be doing something that's not good for you, that older, more authoritative, more powerful people are saying, well, that's not good for you. And if you persist in that activity or in that positioning or in that identity or in that stance, 
you are being willful, you are being deviant, you are being outside. And yes. so willfulness is imposed upon you as a way to get you back into line. Not. Nice. Uh, because you don't, yeah, because willfulness is, is so profoundly outside. It's so profoundly um, deviant that the last thing, you know, the, how dare you be willful. Now that's fascinating to me. So that is a that is a different plat to where Aidan and Thomas have taken us. So that's and that's great that that complexity is introduced early. I might loop back to that, Leanne, when we talk about self help and willfulness shortly, because there's something about being willful and making decisions in one life, one's life, and the self help movement, mm -hmm. which perhaps does what you've wanted it to do, but then reincorporated it through commodification through the self-help movement? Yes. Uh, yeah, well, I think there's a difference between willpower and being willful. Yeah, yes. And I think once you become an adult, you have willpower. And the and we'll just go there for a second because we'll loop back to it, but it'd be just interesting if colleagues can think about this. So they're, therefore willpower is activating power on the self. So we've got so little control of our identity and our politics and our political system at the moment that the greatest thing we can do is have willpower and not eat chocolate cake. And I think that is established very early on in childhood about this, this rhetoric of willfulness. If you're a willful child, what that meant that you don't, that you will not grow up to have willpower. Mm -hmm or that your willpower will be skewed. It will be deviant form. Oh, I'm power. interested in that. Oh, I mean, so can I just, before we leave this point, and I want to just deal with wonderful Karima and talk about the feminist inflection here as well. But so therefore you're, you're suggesting that, that there is a point of willfulness that is not or cannot be commodified. I think it's a transitional label. I think it's a, it's a, it's a whole, it's, it's a holding pattern. It's a way of making sense of somebody that doesn't fit in a particular way. Now I haven't thought through what that means yet about where that is situated. It seems to me it's situated in childhood, it's put onto women, put onto uh, uh, people of color. Yes. Uh, and she, she talks a bit of uh, queering as well. That's exactly you know. right. Yeah. So this idea of stepping outside of what is expected of you is seen as a willful, and you don't pull yourself back into line. If you don't commodify it appropriately, if you don't do the, all the right things, that you are being willful as a deviance. Yes. And of course, I'm and, looking at. And, and that can be, you can take that and empower it, make it agents, make it agency, as Aiden has discussed. And you yes. can say, you can ident have it as an identity and you can turn it into something else. But willfulness to me is a, is a, it's a word that you put around and hold something in place until it becomes what it's going to become. Oh, that's huge. Right. That helps me a lot, Leanne. And again, it's interesting that this same book has created this divergence of argument already. Um, and that explains a lot to me because, I mean, this was a complicated book. This was an intricate book. Um, Leanne well, well said, we need to, as I talked to our beautiful Karima, let's you and I go to the feminist moment, shall we, my queen? Because I want to make sure we did get proper attention on this this week. And I want to talk about willfulness and, and laughter. And we're back to the denial of happiness once more. So, quote, the feminist killjoy, those who refuse to laugh at all the right points, those who are unwilling to be seated at the table of happiness, end of quote, fascinating. So willful women unwilling to get along. So, Karima, where, where are you on feminism and willfulness and what indeed happens to the feminist killjoys, if I use that phrase. Oh my gosh, I'm yeah. having a hard time um, yeah. following so far even. I'm, yeah. I'm trying really hard to focus here, but I'm finding it hard to follow. <laughs> yeah. My and own it's, it's because I think nothing yeah. to do with everyone, to everyone else. Okay, so. So what happens to the, yeah, the I remember reading woman? Sorry. 
The, the willful woman, Karima. So if we start there, you know, if a woman is willful, what connotative structure encircles that? And then when we add the feminist killjoy willfulness, what happens to a woman that, that demands to, to go her own way? Well, I don't know what happens to her, you know, like according to Ahmed, and I agree with her, I guess, she goes by the wayside. She's wayward. She's um, no longer part of the social will, no longer doing their her part for the, you know, all that language around you know, I've, you know, I, that's one word, you know, I'm afraid to use this word because I've heard you say that it gets thrown away around too often, but the word that kept coming to mind, where is it going to be on this page is like a kind of a neoliberal almost way of dealing with, like, that's how I saw her connection between sort of parts, the individual, the personal, what we do as individuals and her, um, you know, sort of her common theme throughout all her books about these sort of heteronormative nationalistic lines and the creation of, you know, the so like these sort of bigger social collective things. So I kept thinking about, I'm, I think I'm getting really off topic. I'm really no, you, nervous and no, I'm not understanding not. the- okay. Can I ask you a provocative question? You are absolutely on the money and I'm fascinated. Is okay. the feminist killjoy, so is the willful woman unable to be hooked back into the neoliberal cloth? So Aidan has made a point about the CEO. So the, the willful uh, boy, the naughty boy, either goes to prison or becomes CEO. And, you know, okay. that's, that's, you know, what, what did Jermaine Greer say? Prisons are filled with single men. Now, now, is it because the, the, the willful woman, money cannot be made from her? Question mark. Oh, oh no, I think money can be made from anybody. I, I'm, a, I'm in that same vein of, you know, that this is just, there's, I just think of all the feminist co-opting that's already occurred, you know, in the 90s. And, and even now you can't watch a commercial that's trying not to, buy into that maybe superficial level of the willful feminist but it certainly is 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 not there's no territory on I don't know how you would unhook yourself and and not be potential bait for that I'm not convinced that that like you said about Foucault and being outside of discourse I really don't and I'm not I'm not saying it's not possible but I can't see how it would be possible I think to that's have that bad. kind of separation, you know, because it's all, I don't know, that's my go to thought. Uh, uh, Karima, I think that's beautifully said. I think your argument there is magnificent. Wonderful, Romy, can I use your expertise at this point? Can I summon your fabulousness to our, our conversation? Where are you on um, feminism and incorporation at its most basic? What's, uh, share, share with us your truth, Romy. Um, I don't know if I can speak to feminism and incorporation, but I can certainly say that I think that will is a site of struggle. I mean, this is a kind of, um, I think, a, a central tenet of feminism is the assertion of a woman's right to, so the seven demands, a woman's right to choose, a woman's right to, um, I can't remember, I'm paraphrasing that, but it's, so, yeah, equal pay, but I was thinking about a woman's right to choose um, her sexuality and to define her sexuality on her own terms, for instance. So I'm thinking about that. And then I'm thinking as we're talking about um, sexual violation and about a woman's body being a um, site of will, who's, who, who does the will belong to? So, um, of course, as a feminist, as a womanist, I believe a person's, a woman's in this instance, will is hers. It belongs to her. But I think that if we think about the um, acts of violence, and particularly I'm thinking here sexual violence, they're about attempting to wrestle will and break will. And um, I think I would also transpose that thought over to, um, you know, uh, 
slavery, the act of attempt to break somebody's will. You know, when you look at uh, when I was in residence in the Houses of Parliament about 13 years ago, and we looked at uh, neck pieces, you know, pieces that were made by blacksmiths that um, were made to uh, contain, to control. I forget the exact name of it, but it's the piece that's uh, placed around the neck and has spokes. So it, it's built to uh, design to stop somebody running, to stop someone being able to run through through um, greenery, through forest, yeah, for any period of time. That's about breaking will, yeah. It's a it's a metaphor. It's both a, a um, an object of control, but it is a statement about an attempt to break will. And I think that that notion, I think, exists across all kinds of abuse is the is the attempt to break this thing we call will and Romy I think that's such a powerful argument and I suppose for me if I had seen more attention to violence I am passionately interested in how we research violence sexualized violence and corporeal violence right and and the damage to the body as a proxy for other damages perhaps to the will or to consciousness so in terms of of violence to the will how do you align violence with this will power argument perhaps offered by leanne as well about distinguishing between will and willpower yes You see, I don't necessarily distinguish the two. I hear what Leanne was arguing. I don't necessarily distinguish the two. I um, see them as connected, um, you know, like feminism is to womanism, what lavender is to purple. I think that the two are, are connected in my mind. And um, when I think about will, I think uh, about last will and testament i think of things like power of attorney i think about the notions of where will is central in all kinds of ways and you were talking at the top about death and i was thinking you know that's the ultimate of wills isn't it the idea that i get to decide what happens to my stuff after i am no longer physically here just as i the notion of that's central to me of feminism is that i get to have decisions over my right to labor to birth i get to make decisions about my right of, of who, who or who i don't sleep with um i the notion of will of self-determination i mean i think she refers to lock in there uh, i noticed so it's about will, will for me is absolutely fundamental to humanity and the notion of humanhood um and uh, the declaration of human rights and I, I love you for saying that and you have convinced me and I think you should be running the world. I mean, that's clearly the case, Robbie. But can I also say, can I, I'll be provocative with you back and you can explain how I'm wrong and I want you to do that. Let's, let's talk about will as in will and testament. Let's, let's go to death because obviously I live there most of the time. You know, the old goth in me just sort of, it's about death. We borrow life from death. And I wonder when we've got the will. So we write the will because we think that we can boss death. So if we, you know, that we actually have control of what happens to us, our body, our stuff, our legacy after death. And I wonder if, if we're lying to ourselves, if the discussion of will is actually delusional and the will and testament is actually a metaphor for the greater you know, disillusionment of do we actually have will? Going back to Aidan's point, have you got a vibe on, on we're lying to ourselves, Romy, that we've got control? I think it depends on the context. I mean, I think if you look at Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, and that that she said it is my will, you know, it's a will that the that you know that uh, that uh, whoever it was 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 would not be elected. That the election process for the Supreme Court of Judges would not take place within a certain time frame. Well, that didn't happen, did it? It went against her will, even though she expressed through her granddaughter that this was her will. So yes, I can. I can totally hear you when you say the notion of, you know, that lovely phrase of, of bossing death. We're trying to cheat death or boss death, but, but, but perhaps that's not possible. But I still think the principle, the idea that you 
even if it's questioned, even if it's usurped, the idea that I hold that it is my right, yeah, it is my right to exercise my expression that there's something within that that I think is foundational to humanhood yeah. and animalhood. I mean, if you broaden it or should be, but I think there's something about an expression of my right to make decisions and about self-determination that I think is very important here. Oh, Robbie, beautifully said. And Aidan, we'll be talking about that for some weeks, I believe. That's a very interesting argument for us to progress in your thesis, I think, sir. Um, Romy, as always, thank you for your tremendous contribution to the planet, frankly. Mel, can I summon you in response to beautiful Romy too? Because I, okay. I'm still fascinated by, and I suppose I, I want to believe, like Romy, I, I want to believe that there's a power in the denial, that, you know, that if we can interrupt if we can intervene in a situation of power, that it is a productive intervention. Do you think by denying um, power or intervening in power that that can be provocative? And you can use any example from COVID, for example, Mel, if you know, people decide to not wear masks, if they decide to you know, not agree with the stay at home order, they have actively denied a power structure. Is that, can that be a, a productive mode of resistance, Mel? Well, so I struggled with this a lot, like Karima did. Um, I, I struggled with the really high theory sometimes. Um, but, you know, I was thinking, you know, she's writing most of this from the point of view that expressions of will, willfulness are seen as a negative um, thing. And, are, and I, I feel like, She's saying that being willful is fighting against power and therefore is kind of positive. Yes. But then on the fl I, I found myself wondering, well, isn't there, there are good moments when the will of uh, certain expressions of will are um, kind of suppressed and that's good for society in some ways. <laughs> so like, um, you know, not wearing masks is an expression of will, but it's also endangering the rest of society. Um, so, yeah, so I kept going back and forth um, as I read it as to, um, well, is, is, is power kind of trying to suppress will always necessarily a bad thing? Or is that how we create norms that we all live by? in society. But then it depends on who creates those norms. And then my brain gets lost in a, in a loop. And, uh... <laughs> and so therefore, the commitment to the public good, public health, public education, which I would argue committing to public health at the moment is a reasonably radical act. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, so actually committing to the public good. So doing something, I, I like to go to the shops. I, I want to go, the, I have the right to go to the shops. Well, is that the act of willpower that you want to fight over? Is, is that, mm -hmm. so my right to consume is worth, you know, truncating or stepping on your right to public health. How do we handle that? I mean, beautifully handled, Mel. Can I go to Aiden on this? Because obviously Aiden is living in hegemony zone. So you are doing the full Gramsci at the moment, the commitment to public good, um, moving common sense to good sense, good sense to common sense, can willpower, what's the role of willpower, mate, in, in that commitment to a politically rigorous citizenship, mate? Yeah, um, I think it's a good, that's a good question. Um, and I think there's, you know, like we can kind of look back at figures over time who've demonstrated, like I would say leadership, um, not even necessarily in what we would consider to be the political world, um, you know, if we look back at, I'm, like, just look at Gramsci, you know, as an example, right? Here's a guy who doesn't have the, he has a lot of willpower, I guess, in a sense, but he's literally imprisoned, um, but still produces, you know, work that is, you know, radically changes the, the Western left 50 years after he's died, right? So, 
you know, there's there's a lot of, and I mean, obviously, you know, there's a male person who has, you know, um, sort of left something in the world, but, you know, there are a lot of different um, authors, particularly that we look back on. And, you know, Tara, I guess that's that link to, you know, the ghosts um, of people that we sort of um, revive when we cite them and think about them. But there's people that have this immense power, even across the time in which they were actually alive, you know, like this sort of projected forward. So I think there's a real connection to leadership in that. And it's people that we see as leaders, I guess, as thought leaders, perhaps that are the ones that challenge us to think differently about the world and to, um, you know, challenge our perceptions and make us see things that we're doing that we probably shouldn't be doing, you know, any of those sort of um, key times. And, you know, like you can think to, uh, you know, feminist activists, you can look at, you know, political activists, anti, um, you know, like the refugees, um, you know, all of those kinds of spaces where people are saying, hey, we're doing this wrong. Um, let's think about a new way of doing it and open up a new conversation. And eventually, like even if not in their time period, but eventually those people have a real impact. And so um, there's something interesting, I think, too, in the, you know, sort of the posthumous um you know, the power of what you've done might not be seen in your lifetime. So, you know, there's a, again, I think for me, it comes back to that question about agency. Look, ev everything does. And you're convincing me it's taken, you know, I'm 52 and I've, I still do not believe in agency. Romy is having a huge impact on me. Aiden's having a huge impact on me, but you know, I, I'm just not sure there's as much space for resistance and decision-making that you know, I would love it to be like a Swiss cheese political system, that there <laughs> is that space to just move a little bit. And I'm just not sure, Aidan. I'm just not sure, mate. And But just to give you, give you an example, uh, those of you that know the Stone Roses, Ian Brown, so for our, our crew in England, of course, know exactly what's happened overnight. So Ian Brown, um, former lead singer of the Stone Roses, the legendary Come on the Roses, uh, has decided, obviously, that he's not going to get a vaccine. And he's not going to perform at festivals where they're demanding that you have you have to have a vaccine, right? So he's been willful. He's gone, vaccines, yeah, no, I'm not putting that in my body. And considering what Ian Brown has put in his body in the last 30 years, that's quite an ironic stance, can I say. But Aidan, is that an example of willfulness, but for what end? Yes. <laughs> uh you know, so we've yeah, got a white bloke. We've got a white bloke, plenty of money, had a successful life, public profile still, and he's been willful. Mm. Yeah, well, that's that. That's I mean, that's again that good and good question of good and bad. You know, like what is what is a you know good. good at? Well, if we had a freeze on Aiden, he still looks handsome, frozen. Have you noticed that? He's still the hair's still in place. It's unbelievable. Aiden, I'm just going to see if we can unfreeze you for a second. See if I can do anything. It's a shame. Aiden, we'll return to you, mate. We might have a, a proper welcome to the Australian internet and the lack of commitment to public utilities. Wonderful people. Uh, we learn a great deal about that. Look, I want to summon, if I can, Leanne and Alyssa. Uh, hi, you two. And I want to talk, because you two are our popular cultural crew on the call, and I want to talk about source material in this book, the material that's used. And we've got George Eliot novels in place. So George Eliot's been used. Now, I'm interested in this. So the choice of material was high cultural. It was, it was the canon. It was the literary canon. And it was described by Ahmed, the phrase I've actually put in a book this week, quote, a willful citational practice, end of quote. Now, Leanne, I'll start with you and then move to Alyssa. Using high culture in this way, using high cultural source material, is that willful in and of itself or is that also reinforcing the status quo? So could popular cultural sources have been activated? And the lack of popular culture in this book is interesting, can I say. Would that have had a, a different inflection on the willful conversation, Leanne? Oh. Source material was odd, wasn't it, mate? I, it was, look, it was odd, but I don't. I don't necessarily think it's a problem per se. I find a certain lack of wider view of that analysis more problematic than her choice. I feel like she misses an opportunity to discuss 
why Eliot chooses to write about willful women and the context of the time in which she's writing. Mm. And I, I feel that gets kind of, that's a missed opportunity. So you wanted, oh, that's interesting to me, you wanted more of the history of the novel. So if some history of the novel was put in place and the role of female authors in the history of the novel, if that had been contextualised more, the argument would have been more resonant? Well, I think Eliot's kind of raising the middle finger when she writes about willful women. I mean, she's she's playing in a very, uh, you know, whether her willful women end up becoming compliant at the end is an interesting thing. It's also, I imagine Eliot was also described as a willful woman herself. I mean, I'm guessing. And that doesn't seem to enter into the consciousness of why Eliot made that choice, perhaps, to write about willful women, that maybe she was using it as a trope to refract her own conditions and the attitudes of the time. And working through personal consciousness. So you yeah. were after, if you are going to go to the Eliot novels, you wanted either more of a history of, of the novel and the role of women authors in it, but also contextualising consciousness at the time. So you wanted the novels contextualised into a social semiotic more. Yes, yeah, so I wanted a bigger picture to enter into the fray. And I don't think she kind of really kind of glosses over, I feel, why the women are willful in the novels yeah. and what that even means. Yes. No, it was, look, it was an interesting choice. It was an mm. interesting choice. I'll, I'll go to beautiful Alyssa. Romy might be straight in on this too, but I just want to go to Alyssa because obviously we live in popular cultural land, Queen Alyssa. Uh, and and there's so much of a, a, will, a series of willful arguments to be made in and about popular culture and consensus, right? So the, the selection of high culture you know, bourgeois culture is the exemplifiers uh, in, in this scholarly monograph was interesting. Have you got a commentary about source material and, and what was used, Elizabeth? So I didn't finish the book yeah. because I didn't get it. Um, and I think all the other ones, like, okay, maybe not the first one, the other ones I have powered through. But, um, I just couldn't, I couldn't latch on to anything. Um, there kind of wasn't really a way for me to get in and then build up an understanding and then maybe go back. Mm -hmm. And I find a lot of the time when I'm reading the examples and the application of it or, or some integration with the real world kind of is where it starts to make sense. And then I can go back and engage with some more of the theory stuff. Mm -hmm. But for this, it was just so abstract and then not understanding any of the kind of source references um i just kind of didn't i didn't get it that wasn't a way for me to understand an example because the example meant nothing to me so I, if, there, if there'd been strategies and noting it was the time you know the global financial crisis was occurring complete climate crisis at this point so yeah. there were popular cultural examples that were available to plat in uh in, in terms of willfulness in the work you're doing in your research, Alyssa, is there some resonance there about the willful woman in gaming communities, for example? Well, yeah, Are I guess women willful. Well, I guess in the communities where your existence is kind of fought against, even being present is an example of that kind of willfulness because you just you're, you're very yeah. Well, more. I'm going to push you because I'm going to push you, Alyssa. So a woman's presence at a gaming table in a D&D &D gig, what does the physicality of a woman actually occupying space, what, what does that do? Is that a willful statement? Is that denial? Is that resistance? How do we understand it, Alyssa? Well, I guess it can kind of be a bit of a fuck you, I'm going to do this anyway. Sorry, bad words if this is on YouTube. Um, <laughs> that, that's clear. Delicate people will, will understand it's you, Alyssa. They'll understand. Um, but there, there have been times where, like, I've sat down at a table full of full of guys and they, they kind of, they do manspreading on the table with their, like, accessories. So, like, dice spread out and character sheets. And then 
you know, you sit down at the edge of the table and you're kind of almost apologetic in your physical presence because you're trying to take up as little room as possible. And so I think just being willful in that, hey, this is what I want to do. I want to be here. I want to play. I want to take up this space. Um, and just kind of spreading your shit out and being like, yeah, I'm here. Suck it. Suck, suck it. Um, that, that's a technical phrase, ladies and gentlemen. So in terms of, in terms of patrolling, um, your body is being patrolled in most gaming cultures. I think there's a desire to kind of push you out in, in from a very like structural, like a lot of gaming stores I've been to, they, they have not got a lot of facilities that are like relevant for, you know, women. It's like the bathrooms might not have bins or like they're disgusting. Um, or there's no toilet paper, which is fantastic. So I think there's kind of like a physical level of like, you're not really supposed to be here and we're not going to make it comfortable for you. That's what I wanted for you, Alyssa. That's perfect. So, so the role of willfulness in actually occupying space, that's a willful act. It doesn't have to be verbal. It doesn't have to be through different cultural texts. There's a physicality to willfulness as well. Yeah, which is kind of interesting to consider with the rise of um, playing online. So like because of COVID and everything, lots of people were playing on Roll20. So, and, and historically, I haven't had a very good experience when using microphone-based technology playing with guys, not necessarily for D&D, but for like com computer games. Um, you tend not to speak because by speaking, you make yourself a target because nobody knows you're a woman necessarily from your username. But as soon as your voice is there, you start attracting abuse. So I guess that's kind of an interesting one because you can kind of fly under the radar a little bit until you really can't. That's fantastic. Can I say, that's not a problem I have in online environments. Uh, but can I say, Alyssa, what you have just done there is written another version of this book through popular cultural studies. That's why I pushed you hard. So there's actually, you've applied some of the tropes there and moved them into a popular cultural space. Cool. Well done. Fantastic. Hashtag suck it. I'm going to put that on a t-shirt. That's great. Now, Leanne, I did promise... <laughs> Alyssa. Leanne, I did promise that we'd go back to self-help. Now, you know I'm obsessed by self-help. I call them the believe in achievers, right? You know those people like, just give me all your money and I'll make you feel empowered. You know those people. And th there's, there is some nice work in this book about the notion of will and self-help. The diagnosis of weakness of will. So self-help comes in when will is seen to be weak in adults. So this is what I'm interested in, the relationship between willpower and self-help. So Dr. Phil, right? Dr. Phil, just make a decision. How's that working for you? You know, so tell me a little bit about the self-help movement and the needing of the willful adult so they can make money. <laughs> well, they're selling happiness, aren't they? You know. They're selling happiness that if you exert enough willpower, you will become happy. And if you don't have the willpower, buy our book and we will help you get the willpower. So, yeah, this is again looping back to this idea of the commodification of willfulness as it translates into willpower. So, maybe thinking about the you know three words will willfulness and willpower yes and what is the trajectory between those and how do they overlap and how are they both good and bad each of those those words and so we have will we perform willfulness and we embody willpower perhaps that's nice can I, can, I, can I provoke you further using another COVID example that I'm obsessed about? Uh, as we know in Australia, Australia is a drinking culture. Of course, none of your other nations are drinking cultures. It's all on us. We are a day drinking culture. But obviously during COVID, I, I mean, the, the sales of alcohol has gone up, I believe, 20 times 
Leanne. I mean, bottle shops that normally would, what was the great figure from the bottle shop down for me? They'd take $3,500 in a day. They've had days of $35,000 a day for booze, right? So, so how we manage heavy drinking, so self-medication during COVID, right? Is that a lack of willpower or is that simply creating a survival strategy for difficult times when the state has failed us? Yes, and I think this is where the work um, on happiness is really provocative here that, nice. you know, it's, it's, it's a really... difficult thing to talk about and I'm just referring to my notes here because there was something I wrote down that was really cool and now I can't find it oh I wrote anyone with an addiction can tell you that a pleasurable sensation does not equal happiness it's a standard or a mask for happiness falsely produced and destructively maintained that's what I'm interested in yeah so that was a note that I wrote down when I was thinking about her when I was reading about her idea of happiness so and that really kind of did bring me back to this, what exactly what you're talking about, the idea of addiction, of, of using alcohol to as a mask. And yes, I, definitely it is a coping mechanism for people. It is self-medicating. It is because they don't feel like they don't have agency because uh, they're, they're falling back on a place where they feel they have agency, which is over their immediate body, whether it's the rejection of the vaccine, whether it's consumption of copious amounts of alcohol, is a way of... of, of of grabbing hold of a willfulness or a willpower, rather, yeah. a willpower over the self to not necessarily make yourself better, but to put yourself into a holding pattern until you can find a way out of it. Interesting. Now, Leanne, I'm going to come back to you in a second. Thomas, we're there. See where Thomas is at, Leanne. So, so Thomas, this is the important moment. Of course, this links with ultra-realist criminology as well, Leanne. So, so is this act of supposed destruction, which is a denial of capitalism, is this actually resistance, Thomas? Is this working class resistance in tough times? So drinking yourself into a kind where you go, oh, look at the self-medicating, all the rest of it. Is this actually the only resistance that is now available? I think it might get pretty close. I'm thinking about kind of the idea of the ideal worker and kind of getting tied up in this like very much American dream that like you have to have the right amount of willpower and the right amount of work and be your own man. Like I've been absolutely obsessed with uh, permaculture discourse at the moment because, you know, like my state went down. So I'm like, how do, how do I not have to experience this again? And it's like a neoliberal nightmare zone of pull yourself up from your bootstraps and so if you refuse to work then I guess you're not participating because I mean if you're going to go spend all the money and go live off by yourself in your like magical earth ship then you're still participating in capitalism to an extent but if you drink yourself you know to oblivion although I guess you could ask the question like you're still paying a corporation to allow you to drink yourself into an oblivion but i guess if you like make moonshine yeah. in like your basement and do it that way i guess you're refusing to participate um but i think it might get closer to it i think it gets closer than anything else we've talked about so far look i i agree thomas i, I and i'm at that level of the you know doomsday end of the world stuff so thomas i th i thank you for that and i just want to go straight back to Aiden on this. So Aiden, this is the conversation we had, brother, about, remember I used that line from Urban Welsh, right? He used that quote, you're either right outside society or you're exploited. Yes. <laughs> so so have, have you got any final, as I'm, I'm starting to quietly sort of bring the filaments together if I can, Aiden, have you got any final commentaries about this profound destruction on and to the self as an act of willpower, an act of resistance through denial. That's the cluster I'm interested in. Um, well, it's, I mean, it's, it's what the communist parties tried to do, right? It's the break out, well, break out from within, honestly. Like it was, it was let's ally these people to our cause 
um, and you know smash smash the system as it exists from within by bringing people together, unifying on you know a, a new ideology, a new way of being and operating with each other in a way that is destructive. It's overthrow the system as it stands and install a new one. And I mean, it failed, right? It failed pretty monumentally. And capitalism demonized, particularly in the US. Um, but, you know, globally demonized alternate ideologies and it really, it actually sort of, um, you know, capitalism sort of subsumed those things as sort of more freedom of choice and more free market and more of this, more of that to like erase possibility of other ideologies. So there's a destructive force in both the resistance to capitalism as a, you know, as the economic social model but also in, in any, you know, in capitalism itself by sort of adapting and subsuming everything underneath it. So the, the destruction is just inherent. And that, that piece that, um, you know, I shared recently about the environment, you know, capitalism just finding new ways of describing nature such that we, we now have, you know, for example, just to go on a real tangent, you know, like people that stick solar panels on their roof, eat a vegan diet and um, complain about, you know, factory farming, for example, are now accommodated in a supermarket right so it's just come back into capitalism everything gets sort of taken back on board as you know this this new avenue to profit from so there's a destruction in that as well so yeah anyway so Aiden and Thomas clearly will will have a relationship in their writing for the next 50 years so I think we've created a new Marx and Engels relationship <laughs> I assume this week but I, I also wonder Aiden if it's I'm at the point now where if you can't be incorporated, as you so beautifully argued, with, with the vegan matter, if you can't be incorporated, is the only solution, therefore, to actually deal with the atomized neoliberal subject? And because you've disconnected from any sense of commodified public good, that you just drink yourself into a coma. So actually, the only way then is just to disconnect and, and die. And that is what we're seeing. We're seeing the suicide rates through COVID have gone from young men in particular have gone through the roof. We're seeing alcoholism. We're seeing the, you know, the, the meth rates skyrocket on we go. So it suggests there is a group that has completely disconnected. Isn't it, Thomas, mate? Talk to me, Thomas. I mean, you've just brought a very heavy interpretation of there is no alternative. Like, like there is no escape at all period because like just listening to Aiden I'm like yeah no I totally can just go online and get on Etsy and buy a bunch of communist swag right now I can get it on hats I can get it on a t-shirt like the ideology gets consumed like everything everything gets consumed so I don't know if we have any other choice but to die Maybe, maybe self-helping our way to death is the ideal. <laughs> and again, I'm putting that straight on a t-shirt. After suck it, self-helping yourself to death is clearly the way forward. Um, unbelievable. Mel, I wanted, I wanted to finish with you, darling one. So guys, what a, what a pleasure. I'm, I'm all pins and needles. I'm all, I'm all a bit weird. This has been quite an amazing, powerful gig. But Mel, I'm aware you and lovely Alyssa were having sort of the conversation in the comments. This was a, a challenging book for colleagues, uh, a challenging book to read. And Mel, I wonder, there was a great line when we we're talking about the role of philosophy in this book. And Ahmed described, quote, not philosophy is practiced by those who are not philosophers and aims to create room within philosophy for others who are not philosophers, end of quote. Now, I love that as a project. But I wonder, Mel, if there's another way to, to do it, because from what I'm picking up from you and Alyssa, there were probably cleaner and crisper examples to use if the project was to bring non-philosophy into philosophy. Have you got a vibe on that, Mel, to finish us off? Ooh, um, I like that bit when she's trying to explain the will as, as not, as the capacity to say no. And that was another way of defining the will. Um, so I thought that was rather interesting. Um, but I'm not, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure about another way to do the discussion. I, yeah, I don't know. I was like, I really did struggle with it. Um, this come and I, I came tonight because I wanted you guys to help me understand it. And, and I feel like a much better place now. So thank you all for that. So, so the, the last question is, 
and this will help me because obviously Alyssa, Alyssa is about to rewrite a different version of this and Thomas and Aidan are about to go and Marx and Engels their way into the next 50 years. So what could have happened in the book, Mel? And this helps me remember I'm finishing off a book on the weekend. What could have happened in the book, Mel, to make it more open for you? Because obviously you wanted to read it, you've read all the other books. What could have in enabled this discussion more for, for greater audience and political uh, debate and discussion? What could have changed, Mel? Mm. I think I think maybe to Alyssa's point, maybe some more like concrete examples of things. Because I I have already read her um, the feminist book, um, and she talks about the killjoy and um, this crazy Brothers Grimm story. She has that in there too, with the arms sticking out of the ground. Um, and I felt like <laughs> I felt like when I was reading that book, the things it made more sense to me. Um, this concept of the will in kind of came up in that book in, in little short bits. And, and I felt like I got it then. But then when she's like focusing on it for an entire book and getting really theoretical about the whole thing. Um, yeah, I think I did struggle more. So maybe maybe some more kind of concrete examples of from popular culture or even media of people exerting will and then being, uh, you know, squashed down by society in some way. Um, yeah, maybe that would have made it make more sense pa powerfully said mel and as my beloved late husband said we do live in theoretical times so <laughs> finding great ways to write high theory for a large audience it is very very difficult to do it is difficult to do and as you've said ahmed had a good go here and you'll you see resonances of it in the final couple of books that we're going to be reading through the series but colleagues i thank you so much for hanging with me during this book going hard stretching our brains having a good go and i've learned a great deal this evening and i thank you so much for your time so have a wonderful day for my australian kiwis good afternoon good evening to the rest of you and thank you for being splendid humans on this complicated planet adore you Bye. see you karina Bye.